So without any further ado, I'm going to give you Bryant B. from Dobson, North Carolina. My name's Bryant Bivens, and I'm an alcoholic. By the grace of God and because uh, this program of Alcoholics Anonymous works in my life a day at a time, I'm sober today. And I said that I'm an alcoholic, and the God that I know and love and understand today gave me the greatest privilege that's ever been given to any alcoholic. That's to be a member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a great pleasure. One of the greatest things that's ever happened to me in my life. And I'll try to tell you about it this morning. Now, I know that a lot of you, some of us said, don't tell that chicken joke, but I'm going to tell it. That's the only one I know. <laughs> Everyone was at the dance last night, and I, I feel that I need to tell this joke because I know that you were up late last night, and uh, uh, that's why I need to tell the joke. I was riding up the mountain in a little town that we live in, and there was a fellow in front of us with a truck. And about every 30 or 40 yards, he'd re reach out the window with a long stick and start beating the side of the truck all the way up the mountain. It took us an hour to get up there. And finally, he pulled off on the side of the road up at the mountain, and I said, I'm going to find out what's wrong with him. So I went and asked him, I said, what's wrong? I said, I bet you beat the side of that truck 25 times going up the mountain with that stick. He said, well, I'll tell you, mister. He said, I've got a four-ton truck here. And I've got eight tons of chicken on here, and if I don't keep half of them flying, I'm in real trouble. <laughs> so about half of you were at the dance last night, and you're sleepy. And if I can keep the other half laughing, maybe we'll keep you awake. <laughs> I guess I'm not the only one that ever planned not to. I didn't plan to be an alcoholic. I know, don't know of anyone that did. I don't know if anyone that took a drink and said, here's to it, I'm going to be a, an alcoholic. Didn't plan for it to be that way. I despised alcohol. My daddy was an alcoholic. And I was literally afraid of him. And I was afraid of anyone who drank. I'd see someone who was under the influence and I'd withdraw. And I'd become extremely fearful. So I didn't think I'd ever have any problems with it. But on looking at myself as I really was, I had this fear at an early age. Fear dominated my life for many, many years, as, as, Al Port as, as our speaker last night pointed out. And a couple of others talked about fear. And fears dominated my life. I had some resentments, too, and some frustrations early in my life. My daddy was a tobacco man, and he was a very capable man, capable of making a lot of money. But I told you he was an alcoholic, so he was more capable of spending it than he was making it. And I didn't understand why. We had to come up short a lot of times. I couldn't understand why the rest of the kids in the neighborhood rode a new bike and I rode a rusty one. I didn't understand that. And this was very frustrating, and my frustrations led to resentments, and my resentments eventually led to hate. So I had fear of frustrations and resentments at an early age. I had another thing that was wrong with me at an early age, too. Uh, I was the biggest liar that ever lived. Not after I started drinking. Mm -mm. Right after I started talking. I would tell a lie to make me look better or you look worse, whatever the occasion was, and I became real good at it. So I look at my situation now and all of these underlying causes of alcoholism that we study about today, uh, I didn't have a chance to be anything other than an alcoholic. I hear people say that they drink themselves into alcoholism. I hear others say that uh, it was a progressive type of thing with them. I hear others say that they were born alcoholics and the only way I know to describe mine, I was an instant alcoholic, uh, about like instant potatoes. You know, uh, they're not much if nobody pays much attention to them as long as they're sitting on the shelf in the grocery store. So when you start adding liquid, things start happening. <laughs> and that's the way it was with me. When uh, I started adding alcohol in my life, things started happening. Now, I never was satisfied with anything I had. I never was satisfied any location or, or any person that I was with. I just was a person that was not satisfied. And I started not to go to this party that night because I knew I wouldn't be satisfied, but I went instead. And the boys there had some wine, and they asked me to participate, and I said, well, that's not liquor. 
So I drank a glass of wine, and before it went around to everybody else, I had my second glass of wine. And when that second glass of wine went down, things started happening. It went all over me. I mean, I could feel it in the bottom of my toes, and, and my stomach was warm, and it went down to my fingers, and, and uh, uh, my mouth started running. Some in my group said, yes, and it hadn't quit yet. <laughs> but immediately the fears left. Immediately the fears left, and immediately the resentments left. I loved everyone, and, and uh, I no longer was I inadequate. I was sufficient. I was sufficient, and I found a place where I belonged. And this is where my alcoholic thinking started, right then. I said, if two drinks, if two drinks will make me feel this good. Uh, yeah, I can already see some of you smiling. You know what I'm going to say, and you never heard me before. If I said, if two drinks will make me feel this good, then four is going to make me feel twice as good. And that's how I want to feel twice as good, because, you see, I've never been satisfied. Feeling better than I'd ever felt in my life. All inhibitions, and, everything, and but I wanted to feel better. And this was the story of my life, and I got drunk that first night, and I woke up the next day, I was deathly sick, but it didn't seem to bother me too much. Now, if I'd eaten something that made me that sick, I am sure that I'd never touched it again as long as I lived. But I woke up the next morning, and I was sick at my stomach, and my head was hurting, and I was hurting all over. But I had rem could remember back to the night before, when I had felt good for a while, and I said, there has to be some mixture. There has got to be some way that I can drink and not be sick, because I definitely want to feel the way that I felt last night from now on. Fourteen and a half years old. I was ready for Alcoholics Anonymous in about two weeks. weeks. I didn't know how to drink. I thought you were supposed to drink it as fast as you could, as often as you could. And I did. But I was taught later. The gentlemen don't drink like that. The gentlemen learn how to hold their liquor. They can walk straight. And uh, uh, they, they don't slur their words. And uh, they're not real sloppy like you are. And so I set about to learn how to drink like that. And by the time that I learned how to drink like that, I was totally addicted to alcohol. Totally addicted. Now, I knew I wasn't drinking the way my friends were drinking. They'd get too much, and they said, I think I'll go home. I've had too much to drink. Not me. I'd go to town. And uh, that's a bad place to go when you've had too much to drink. And I started getting in some trouble pretty early. And since I didn't know anybody that was any smarter than I was, I had a talk with myself. I said, Self, you've got to do something. This is controlling you instead of you controlling it. My mother wanted me to go to Duke University. Well, I went out there for a couple of weeks, and uh, they didn't want me there nearly as bad as my mother wanted me there. <laughs> and they suggested a junior college for me. And I went to a junior college, and the junior college suggested that Duke was crazy. But I figured that I was smart enough to get by in this world anyhow. Alcohol was doing this for me. But I knew that I had to do something. And I tried every way. I tried drinking only at night. But when you drink only at night, you drink faster. And I tried drinking at certain times. And when you do that, you lie about what time it is. And I tried drinking only certain things like beer, two or three cases a day, but I did this certain thing. But everything that I drank made me drunk. And every way that I drank, I got drunk. So I had another talk with myself, and I said, Self, you need some responsibilities. You've only been a work playboy. And uh, you work and you play, and that's all you do. You don't have any responsibilities. If you had more responsibilities, that would give you less time to drink. You could devote more time to your responsibilities and less time to your drinking. Now, if I was speaking to a Lions Club or something, they'd be nodding their head, but you're laughing about it. <laughs> because you know what my problem was. It wasn't responsibilities. My problem was alcohol. My problem was alcohol, but I set out to, uh, to get a wife. And I, it took me a week longer uh, than did Marilyn. Now, three weeks, I think, it took me uh, to find a wife, and, and we got married, and and I said, I'm going to be a husband and a father, and I'm going to be a responsible person. And I did real good for two or three weeks. I didn't drink anything but beer. An awful lot of it, but I didn't drink anything but beer. But 
I got to the point that that didn't do the job. I had to have something stronger. And you know what happened. Uh, I got back into the strong stuff and got back into the squirrel cage. Drinking to live and living to drink. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you or not, but it seemed like one point in my life that everybody on the face of this earth wanted me to quit drinking at one time. <laughs> Everywhere I went, it was suggested to me that I stop drinking liquor. And I, I'd, I'd go home, my wife would say, why don't you quit? And I'd get mad, and I'd go to work, and they'd say, why don't you quit? And I'd go to my mother's, and she would say, why don't you quit? And I'd go to the bar, and they wouldn't sell me a drink. Uh, and I had money in my pocket. That's an insult when you can't buy a drink. I even went in a public restroom, and a fellow that I'd never seen before in my life says, what, man, you need to get off that stuff. You're in bad shape. <laughs> Okay, everybody wanted me to quit. So finally I said, if it's so important to them, then by God, I'll just quit. So one Monday morning, I decided to quit. Another reason that I decided to quit, I didn't have any liquor. That's a good reason to quit. Monday is a good time, and no liquor is a good reason. But you know, for eight years, eight years, I had been clinically drunk. Now, I don't mean I was falling down drunk every minute of the time, but I could have got up most any of those mornings and after I'd been sleeping at night and done you about a 15 or 20 on the breathalyzer. Uh, I just never did run out of gas. I kept going. And those of you who have quit know that it's a little more difficult than just quitting on Monday. But I didn't know that because, you see, I'd never quit before. And as Monday grew longer, I grew shakier. And when my wife got home from work that afternoon, I was vibrating. I wasn't shaking any longer. Now, when we had gotten married, uh, seven or eight months prior to that, I'd gone to our family doctor. And this is the first time that everybody, anybody had ever actually put their finger on my alcoholism. I went in for a blood test. I told him what he wanted, and he said, have a seat, I'll be with you in a minute. He came in, and he started telling me about alcoholism and about a, a treatment place that he had for alcoholics out on the edge of town and about how much he had studied about alcoholism. And I thought he was nuts. I said, well, he's a little senile. I'll, I'll go along with him for a while here. Finally, he told me what he wanted to tell me was about my drinking. He said, I've observed your drinking habits and pattern for the past few months, and I'm of the opinion that you're already an alcoholic, certainly a serious problem drinker. And if you continue, I don't have much promise for you, but if you can stop, you've got a great future ahead of you. I was resentful anyhow, so I resented that. And I told him real smart, like if he'd give me that paper, I'd get out of there and I wouldn't bother him anymore. Well, this was nine months later. And I called the doctor and I apologized to him for the way that I, I talked with him that night. And I said, if he'd come over right away, uh, I, I needed some help. I wouldn't apologize to him, I don't believe yet, if I hadn't needed him. But I did. He came over that night and he gave me a shot. And the next day, he carried me out to the funny farm to sober up and dry out. Now, this was my first experience at drying out. And we won't go into any long, drawn-out ordeal about how many places that I went to and, and uh, all the different treatment places that I went because I went to every one that was open prior to 1960 at least one time. Now, once was usually enough for everybody uh, to drive me out. I went to a lot of private hospitals to dry me out. And they'd give me a shot and make it a little easier for me, and I'd get back to the job. It was 1955, and I came home from an institution, and my wife wanted me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous, I said. She said, yes, sir, I'm going to leave again, and I'm leaving for good. I said, well, why not go to Alcoholics Anonymous? She called two fellas, and I knew one of them. One, one of them had been the sorriest drunk I'd ever known in my life, and he looked pretty good. And I said, well, hams learn how to drink like a gentleman, so I'll just go down there with them and learn how to drink and not be sick. That's what I want to do. I went with them to Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's awful hard to find something when you're not looking for it. <laughs> I was looking for a way to drink and not be sick, and uh, they told me that first night that uh, that wasn't what they were there for. They were talking about sobriety. 
and I started getting a little sicker. One fellow said he'd been sober a year a day at the time, and that made me even sicker. Another one said he hoped he could stay sober the rest of his life a day at the time, and I thought I was going to throw up. <laughs> but this is where I started the learning process, unbeknowing to me. The people in Alcoholics Anonymous were nice to me. I could tell that they were genuine. I could tell that I wasn't dealing with a bunch of phonies because I knew a phony. I was one, and I'd been dealing with them for a long, long time, and I knew a phony. But these people were genuine, and they were real. And they told me, they said, you're young. You have many years ahead of you, and you don't have to make the mistakes that we've made. You don't have to go down as far as we did. They explained the progressiveness of the illness of alcoholism to me, and I understood what they were talking about, but I did not accept it. I started looking for reasons that first night to get out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it still took me four meetings to get away. I've never seen anything like it. I started looking around and there, I was 25 and everybody else was 50 and I said, well, this is fine for those guys that's over the hill. And when I get that age, I'll probably come down here too. But I've got to have a lot of more fun before I get in that stage. So I'm too young to be an alcoholic. There was a man that I'd known there since a child. And he was one of the sharpest men I've ever seen in my life. Alcohol had dulled his reflexes somewhat, and he had a little bit of brain damage. He also had four years of sobriety. But I said, I'm not like him. I haven't had any brain damage. There were some winos there. And I said, winos? I'm not like those. Certainly, I haven't been down on the other side of the tracks drinking that stuff. Deep being alcoholic. And it wasn't until I was down on the other side of the tracks drinking that stuff that I realized that I was in the right place in the beginning. But it still took me four meetings to get away from Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd be in the store and I'd turn around and one of them would be there and say, how you doing, Brian? I started in the liquor store one day and one of them was passing right by and he said, how you doing? It was a terrible ordeal getting away from those, but I went back. I went back to the life that I wanted. They told me that there was nothing wrong with me that a drink wouldn't make worse. But they didn't describe worse to me. They didn't describe it as the hell that I know it today. And the next five and a half years of my life was a total disaster. Everything seemed to disintegrate right in front of my eyes. And I couldn't know, I had no idea of telling you why this was happening to me. Everything that I'd worked for, everything that I'd hoped for, everything that I'd dreamed of was gone and I couldn't seem to get a handle on anything. I found myself in places that I wouldn't ordinarily go, and I said, what am I doing in this dive? This is not my type of place. But I'd find myself back there the next night, and I would enjoy it a little bit more. It wasn't so bad the next night. And the next night, it wasn't nearly as bad. And pretty soon, it was a regular hangout of mine. That's alcoholism as I know it. I found myself with people whom I ordinarily wouldn't associate with, and I said, what am I doing with this bunch of yo-yos here? They're not my kind of people, but I'd be back the next night with the same people, and I liked them a little better, and pretty soon these people became friends of mine. That's alcoholism. As a child, I was taught principles, the same principles that I'm taught in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. The principle of honesty, the principle of love, the principle of purity, and the principle of unselfishness. The same principles that we have. And I started sacrificing my principles one at a time. I dropped my guard and another principle would be gone and pretty soon I had no principles to live by. And when you have no principles to live by, my friend, you don't have much of a life. And I didn't have much of a life. It was a mere existence for five and a half years. I tried to hold on, and I tried to keep from going down, but I couldn't. And I couldn't see life without alcohol, and I couldn't live life with alcohol. That's how I found myself. And I used all of the excuses to drink. I used the excuse that I was having fun. I've just described some of this fun to you. Jail. Fifty times, and the fun kept coming. 
<laughs> I lost my business. Lost my business. I went in there and the door was padlocked and it wasn't my lock. <laughs> but the fun kept coming and, and uh, my wife left and they sold my house. It belonged to me. And they didn't even give me the money. They gave it to her. And the fun kept coming. I fooled myself. I said, I drink. I'm so nervous, I need a drink. I'm so nervous, I need a drink, and I'd take a drink, and four days later, I'd be going like this. But I took that drink for my nerves. I'd take a drink for an appetizer. If I had a little drink, I believe I could eat. I'd go weak and wouldn't eat a bite, but I took that drink to give me an appetite. I took a drink to be sociable, and I'd go eight or ten days and wouldn't see a soul. But I took that drink to be sociable. I got to agree with what Dr. William Silkworth said. And a lot of my friends says, I like the taste of it. And that's good. I'm glad you did. I didn't. I never did like the taste of anything I drank. But I told you that I did. I drank it for the taste of it. And Dr. Silkworth said men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. That's why I drink, and I'm sure some of my friends that drink it for the taste, if that's all they'd ever got out of it and never any feeling, I'm sure they'd have quit long ago. But uh, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Even though we know and admit that it's harming us, it's injurious to our health, we can't see life any other way except our alcoholic way and it says we get irritable and we get restless and we get discontented and that's how I was doing in these eight and ten and in twelve and two months of sobriety that I had I was restless and I was irritable and I was discontented because I wanted to drink and I was irritable and restless and discontented as long as I could stand it and then I would succumb as the book says and I'd take that drink, and I'd go through the, the stages of a well-known spree. And every time I'd get sober, if it was two weeks I stayed drunk or three weeks, I would come back and it would be more remorse, more regret. Every time it got worse, just like Dr. Selfworth described. And unless, he said, and unless a complete psychic change occurs in my life, there's little hopes of my recovery. I want to tell you about one of my visits to the asylum. It's, people have a lot of trouble these days getting into these places. My trouble never was getting in. I had a hard time getting out because <laughs> they thought I was in the right place. I went to the hospital for the asylum, and, and after, they, after they got me out of the sport coat I was wearing, uh, the DTs and the convulsions, uh, then we went in and they started explaining an anabuse program that they had and they would discharge me early if I agreed to take anabuse and I said, oh yeah, I'll take it. I'll take anabuse. Now you, if you drink with that, it'll make you real sick. Of course, I never did get the chance to experiment with anabuse because I played games with these people. I told them exactly opposite from what they wanted to hear. The psychiatrist would come in and uh, he said, well, everyone is a turkey from Turkey. He said, everyone seems to be happy today. I said, how do you know that? He said, everyone is smiling. I said, some big spoons we have to eat with, man. Uh, <laughs> ain't, ain't nobody happy here. <laughs> we got bars on the door. But I'd play games with him, and I'd tell him exactly opposite from what he wanted to hear. And he'd sit there and look at me for 30 minutes, and I'd leave. And I'd sit out in that long hallway and gloat over how I'd screwed everybody up. And time came for my discharge, and I had my clothes packed. They said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going home. They said, we don't think you're quite ready. Come into the office. And a grave mistake had been made. Uh, there was a, a commitment process that a minimum of 30 days and a maximum of 180 days. And each one of these suckers could have been renewed for a longer period of time. My discharge was dependent upon approval by the staff there the ones that I'd been playing all the games with, and I knew that they were not going to approve any discharge for me. So I had another one of those talks with myself. I said, Seth, you better start saying some things they want to hear. <laughs> you won't, you'll be here a long time if you don't. And I'm glad I had that talk because that was in, in 1957. I could still be there. 
That's the reason they got places like that. For people who have behavior like I had at that time. But I told them that I was pulling their leg, uh, that I was going to try to make an attempt to do what they wanted me to do, and in short order, I was discharged in a few days. But this is the kind of guy that I was. And then I got to the point that nothing seemed to matter. You know, I hear a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous talking about taking the geographical cure. They moved. I'm going to L.A. It's better for me. I'm going to New York. Well, I didn't ever get able to move. I was always drunk or getting over a drunk or in a hospital from being drunk. So I never was able to move. Besides, all I wanted to do was drink liquor, and it was all I wanted right there at home, so I didn't have to move to get it. My problem was I just never did go home. You know, I'd stay gone from home several months at a time, and I never would go. And there's an old proverb back home that goes like this, he that leaveth and returneth not stayeth gone for a long time. <laughs> And that, that was my problem. I just didn't never go home. I saw a television show the other night. Alice, one of the girls' daddy's been gone 30 years. <laughs> and he strolls in as nothing has ever happened. You know, and they want to know where he's been. And he's been, well, why did it take you 30 years? He said, well, you know how it is. You know how time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> so that's about the way that I was. But then... During this period, I couldn't get the handle on anything, and I kept going down, down, and down. And I found myself on Skid Row in my own hometown of Durham, North Carolina. Not a position that I'm proud of, but if this is what it took to bring me to Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm grateful. Panhandling money from business associates and friends that I'd known over the years to satisfy my habit. And it became a way of life for me for several months. And it wasn't too bad in the beginning because I didn't have any responsibility. Nobody expected me to look good. Nobody expected me to smell good. Nobody expected anything out of me, and there wasn't any pressure on it. My responsibility was to get enough money to stay drunk on that day. But then, then the physical part caught up with me, and I started deteriorating. Cirrhosis of the liver, the doctor had already told me that I was going to die, and I said, that's all right. Oh, I'm glad that God didn't answer all of my prayers. I really am. You know, we get worried sometimes. God didn't answer my prayer. Well, my friends, I prayed to die. I prayed to die several times, and I'm glad that he didn't answer that prayer. I didn't really want to stay dead. I just want to be dead two or three days. <laughs> I, I didn't have any intention of making the permanent thing, but, you know, two or three days is all right. I could handle that. But I was an outcast in society, and I was as low as a human being could possibly get. Christmas Day of 1960, and I had a pint of 100 proof vodka, and I, I felt bad. And I said, I'll drink some of this, and I'll get rid of that. And I drank about a third of it, and nothing happened. And I got worse. I drank another third, and I got even worse. And I finished her off, and I was worse than I was before I started. I was in a little room, in a little room in a flop house. There were several fellows that had been staying in this place, and all of them had moved out because they couldn't stand me. They couldn't tolerate me. Two of them died of chronic alcoholism, and I was there. And every time I'm allowed to tell my story, I know that I shouldn't be here. I know that I should have been one of those that made an exit, but I didn't. When I start telling people about the grace of God, I can't comprehend it, how anybody could love me enough to let me live the life that I did. To be the creature that I was and then give me another opportunity and say I love you. I can't comprehend that, but you might. And I did exactly as you did when alcohol didn't do the job for you. I panicked. I said, what am I going to do? And I fell to my knees on that floor, and I said, God, if you'll give me one more opportunity. Now, heretofore, I'd bargain with God. If you do this for me, I'll do that for you. But this time, I didn't have any bargaining power. I didn't have anything. And I said, if you'll give me one more opportunity. That was Christmas Day of 1960, and by his grace, I haven't had a drink since then. I went to a treatment center, a non-medical treatment center, in the shape that I was in. 
It was a free ride, and it was all I could afford. And they didn't give me any medicine. They didn't give me that much corral to hide and said, we'll be back around in four hours. They didn't give me a drink every three hours. They didn't give me a handful of pills. They didn't shoot me with a needle. They sat on me, and they said, we love you. And I got sober. I'll tell you, it took me a week to fill out an application because I couldn't remember my family's name. That's the condition of body and mind that I found myself in. And finally, after 12 days, I had a clear thought. I woke up in the morning and I remembered how sick I'd been. I remembered that vividly. And I haven't forgotten it a single morning since then. And God help me if I ever do. The second thing that I remembered, and this is important, the second thing that I remembered was the honesty and sincerity of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, if I live, if I live, I'll go back, because that's where I belong, I think. And I went back to Alcoholics Anonymous looking for something. And the first meeting that I went to, I found something. I didn't find the whole nine yards. I didn't find it all, but I found something to build from that night, and it was hope. Without hope, we don't have very much. So I found something to start with that night. These people started describing their conditions of body and mind and some of their thinking. And I said, I identified with them and I said, I'm, I'm home. I'm right here where I belong. One guy told me, he said, it's not uncommon for us to wake up in the middle of the night, perspiring, shaking, afraid. He said, this happens to a good many of us. It happened to me. And I, I knew what he was talking about. I expected to feel that way that same night. And I said, what do you do? He said, you do the best you can. He said, if you can't sleep, get up. Walk some. And if you're not able to walk, try to read the big book. And if you can't read the big book, call an AA member. But he said, you're not going to die of being nervous. And he's right. I'm still nervous today. I always have been and always will be nervous. But it ain't killed me. He said, we have some sleepless nights. He said, but I never have known anybody to die of being sleepy. He said, eventually you'll go to sleep if you're tired. I'm glad he didn't tell me to go home and take two yellow jackets. I'm glad he didn't do that. But I started out that door that night, and I had a sense of belonging. And a little lady stopped me. And she said, we want you to come back. And you'll never know. You'll never know how good that made me feel. You'll never know what it was like for her to go over and fix me a cup of coffee and make me sit down at the table and drink it with her. And she told me about some of the problems. She said, we still want you to come back, regardless of what you've done. She said, leave that past. Remember just enough of it that you don't have to repeat it. Remember the people you've harmed. Remember what alcohol has done. And start from right now doing the best you can. One day at a time and you can make it. He was right. We need more like Martha. Martha's gone. But the Bryants haven't gone. They're still coming into my group every day. And it's my job to be a Martha, to tell them that we're glad to have them and want them to be back. Now, I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, and you hear that some of us are sicker than others. Sometimes you hear it until you get sick of it. But that's how I was. You know, that's how I was. I was sicker than your average person. I'd go to the meeting, I'd listen to speak. I said, wasn't he great? And I'd get outside the club room. I said, what did he say, though? Uh, I couldn't seem to retain anything, but I was at the meetings. They told me to go to the meetings, not to miss any. And if there wasn't a meeting there, to go out of town to a meeting. And I did. I did one thing right, or two things. I didn't take a drink, and I was at the right place. I always tried to put myself in the right position. And I went to Alcoholics Anonymous for four or five months. And I didn't get any better. I didn't drink any liquor, but I didn't get any better. And I could tell that the people that were patting me on the back, it was getting a little weaker. You know, it wasn't that strong pat that I used to get. It wasn't that strong handshake they sort of looked at me. And that's how I got a sponsor. I didn't ask anybody to be my sponsor, and nobody wanted to take me on either. And the group started worrying about me, and they assigned me a sponsor. That's the tough way to get one because they always assign the toughest sponsor to the toughest cases. And my sponsor was a tough one. He was a champ. He was a super sponsor. He never told me anything that I wanted to hear. He told me the truth. A great man. He called me up there 
And he said, I don't like this any better than you do, but they've asked me to be your sponsor. And I couldn't say anything. I was overwhelmed. I just said, oh. That's all I said. And he said, you've been coming to these meetings for four or five months. You've been listening to our speakers. You've been eating our cake and drinking our coffee, and you don't even wash your cup. You don't clean up. He said, you're not capable up here of doing a lot of things, but you can clean up. And I started cleaning up that night, and he told three others in my group, new ones. He told three others the same thing, and we had to clean his club room anyway. He told me a lot of things. I told him, I said, I've got to have my wife back. I said, it's easy for you to stay sober. It's easy for you to stay sober. But you've got your family. You've got all the encouragement in the world. I said, but I'm alone. He said, you're a lie. You're not alone. You've got this group. I said, but I've got to have my wife back to stay sober. And he said, the book don't say that. <laughs> and that's the first time I read the big book. <laughs> See if he was lying to me. <laughs> and it says, wife or no wife. My sobriety wasn't dependent upon people. It was dependent upon my willingness to trust in God and clean out. But I bugged him about that. I said, I got to have my wife back. And he said, no, no, don't worry about it. Worry about the program. Worry about getting well. Worry about turning things around for you so that you can handle your wife. I was at a lot of places that I wasn't supposed to be. And one night in the group, he gave you one warning, one private warning. If you were doing something wrong, he'd come to you and say, I don't like that. That's not the, the principles of alcoholics enough. And so he gave me one private warning. In the next closed meeting, he announced it to the group. <laughs> he said, boys, he said, Brian tells me that he wants to get his wife back. But I see him out here with one of these old broads three or four nights a week. And he said, I'm sure that she would be proud of that. He said, he's smart, and I know he's smart, but he can't build a new life on old principle. And he says, you're out there playing poker every Tuesday and Wednesday night. You're trying to take something that don't belong to you. And he said, I don't see anything in the book about that either. He said, so you clean up your act, and things might start happening for you. And then he came to me and told me that he loved me, and that he really wanted this program to work for me in my life. I stayed sober 18 months, and my sponsor told me that I could go talk to my wife. And I told her I'd been sober for 18 months, and she said, I know it, I haven't seen your name in the paper. <laughs> told her that I had a lot of friends. She said, that's good, you didn't have any when you left. I told her that I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, that's good, and I hope you stay sober from now on, but I have no intentions of ever living with you. I called my sponsor and told him what she said. He said, come on back. You'll find another one. And I did. I found another one in Alcoholics Anonymous. But I listened to some people when I first came in, and we still have them today that will come by and say, AA is like a cafeteria line. Take what you like and leave the rest. Well, now, if somebody's told you that, don't believe it. Because I took the easy part and left the hard part. You know, somebody said, when is it easy to stay sober? I said, as soon as you get through the hard part, it's easy then, it's easier to stay sober. But I had not encountered the, the soul-searching and the leveling of my pride that is required to recover from alcoholism. I hadn't done it, but I'd listened to those people, and I appreciate what Marilyn said about watered-down AA, and my friends, that's watered-down AA. I'd listened to them. And I'd picked out my cafeteria-style stuff, and I was miserable with it. I was miserable with it. I had listened to the ones that said the, the one that got up the earliest this morning has been sober the longest. Usually the ones that say that are the ones that just had a slip not too long ago, and they make a practice of getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, if you got drunk last week and you got up 4 o'clock this morning, you sure as hell ain't been sober longer than I have. I can tell you that, but I believe such stuff as this. I listen to the no-must people. There are no must in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, if you don't want to stay sober, there are no must. But, you know, I listen to the suggested. It's just a suggested program. I listen to that, and that's watered down Alcoholics Anonymous as far as I'm concerned. I have an obligation to make it just as attractive that alcoholic on the street. And I can't do it by telling him half measures will avail you something. 
when the book says it don't. I've got to be truthful with him. And I'm going to have to tell him that it's not easy, but it's worthwhile. And it's up to me not to tell him how to do it, but to walk with him and to show him how to do it. And I'm glad today that there are some members of Alcoholics Anonymous who do practice the principles in their affairs because that's one of the reasons why I'm here. I listened to these people until I got uncomfortable. And then I had to get the book down. And I had to look at it for me. I had to go through the soul searching. I had to go through the leveling of my pride. I had to go through it with my sponsor and there was a lot of amends that I had to make that I didn't think I should have made. I didn't think that I should make amends to a judge who had given me an active sentence, but I had a resentment. And he told me I had to make amends to it. He told me I had to resolve this thing. He gave me a lot of information, and I started trying to work this program in my life. It was almost two years sober, and then things started working for me. When I started working for it, as the speaker last night says we, uh, the, in the promises, they will always materialize, always, if we're willing to work for them. I wanted fringe benefits, but I wasn't willing to work for them. So I started working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to the best of my ability, and things started happening. I started getting a, a feeling of well-being. A feeling of well-being came over me, and it hasn't left me to this day, and I don't believe it ever will as long as I keep working at it. I didn't like the things that I had to do. I didn't like those things. I, I, I thought that staying sober was enough, but it wasn't. I wouldn't be fulfilling my obligation. So I had a lot of things to overcome. I had a lot of adversities. I found out that I had glaucoma and that I might eventually go blind. And it just seemed to bother me. And the doctor said, the more you worry about it, the worse it's going to get. So you've got to stop doing that. And so I started thinking about it, and I asked God. I asked God to help me with my worry and my tension and my anxieties. And he did. The glaucoma, although it's an adversity, is a plus in my life. Because God was a part of it. There's a song that goes like this. It says, little is much if God is in it. And I believe that. No matter how little it is, if God's in it, it's an awful lot. And so he took this adversity that I had and gave me a blessing. The freedom of anxiety and fear and the freedom of worry. This judge that I had to go to, I'd known him all my life. He'd sponsored me in the YMCA when I was a kid. He sponsored me in the Civic Club. He introduced me to my wife. And then I started coming before him for an awful lot of reasons. And he started covering up for me, and they became so numerous that he couldn't cover up any longer. And finally, I stood before him, and he gave me an active sentence. And I despised him, and I hated his guts. Told me that I had to go to him. And so I had to pray about that some. I prayed about it, and I finally went to him, and I, I said, I don't hold any malice in my heart towards you at all. I realize that you did what you had to do. I realized that it was my fault. And I'd like to ask your forgiveness for giving you all the discomfort and everything that I've caused you because you don't deserve it. That old man sat there and cried like a baby, and I did too. But I can remember, I could remember those tears of bitterness that I'd cried when he gave me that active sentence. I remember the nights that I was laying there on a steel bunk, and I would cry and I'd curse. And I compared these tears of joy with the tears of bitterness. And I had to say another prayer. I said, thank you, God, for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it didn't stop there. The judge called me in the open court one day. And I guess there were as many people in that courtroom as it is in this room. And there were four or five guys sitting on the front seat, and they didn't look good, and they didn't feel good, and they didn't smell good. They'd been in the drunk tank all night long. And the judge told them, they were standing up, and he said, I want to introduce you to a man who at one time was like you. But he's found a new way of life, and today he's one of our most respected, beloved citizens. And if you'd like to be discharged in his custody today, I'll allow this to be done. And I stood there and cried again because I know that God is still at work through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, two of those dudes have never had a drink since that day. But that's not my blessing, that's their blessing. My blessing was that I knew everything was all right between the judge and me, my wife. I met her in Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, God, you don't want me to be lonely the rest of my life, do you? 
And I met her in Alcoholics Anonymous, and we were married, and we share this program together. My sponsor went with us to get married so that his prophecy would be fulfilled. <laughs> he went with us to get married, and we worked this program together. She has hers, and I have mine. But we work it together, and I don't know of any two happier people in the world today that, than we are. We've had our problems, no doubt about it. You know, any fool can make it when the going is good. Anybody can make it when you're having a good day. It's when you have the bad days that this program comes in. You know, we went through the change of life together at the same time. You know, that's when you need a program. And I wouldn't trade her. I wouldn't trade her for anybody in the world. I have a job today. One of the, the most degrading things that I thought that ever happened to me was when I went to Damascus home. That was the last place, the non-medical facility that I sobered up in. And it was a farm, and there were a lot of, of people there that were illiterate and degenerate. And, and I, hell, I was one of them, you know. Uh, but I couldn't recognize that. And I walked those grounds and I cried. Tears that big, because this was the end of the world. You know, I came to love that place because it was my salvation. And five years after I was sober, I went back as superintendent of the treatment center. And I walked the grounds and I cried again and I said, God, it's, he took another adversity and he's given me a blessing. And I thanked him again for the job that I have. You see, alcoholism, we can look at that and we want to forget about it. But the promise just says we will not regret the past nor always shut the door on it. No matter how far down the ladder we've gone. We'll find out how our experience can benefit us. So, you know, I'm taking my life that was wasted, that you people helped me to mend, and God had a, a tremendous hand on all of us. I'm using it now to help people. First year that I was sober, I, I went to my little girl, and I was trying to buy her love, and I carried her a bunch of, of uh, presents. And she said, I don't want them. I don't want them. I don't love you. And I really don't care to see you again. And I left there, and again I was crying tears the size of a silver dollar because I love that child. But she told me to be patient, and I was impatiently patient. That's the best way that I know to describe it. And she began to understand a little bit about alcoholism. And we began to have a little bit of communication. And when she graduated from high school, I was there, and she graduated with honor. She had some scholarships and, and uh, some awards. And I said, honey, I'm real proud of you in spite of the way that I've done. I want you to know that I'm real proud of you. And she said, Daddy, I don't want you to sell yourself short. If I had to be like anybody in the world today, I'd want to be like you. Man, you can't buy that. You can't buy that, but I knew that another adversity in my life that God had had a hand in it. And you know, I got four grandchildren today. And, and I wouldn't trade places with anybody in the world because I'm a happy man. But I guess my daddy, I had resented him for many, many years. But you told me to pray. He told me to pray for anybody that I resented. And I started praying for him. It wasn't much to begin with. It was just God bless him. And then I could say, God bless him and mean it. You know, and that was, uh, that was a real deal, I thought, for me. And then I, I could say, God bless him and take care of him because I love him. And my daddy died uh, 12 years ago. And my wife and my sister and I went down to the funeral. And we got there about an hour before the funeral. It was down in South Carolina. And... We went in to see my daddy, and instead of the traditional handkerchief in his pocket, he had a serenity prayer pen. He'd been sober three months when he died. And you know, I almost missed that. But it doesn't stop there. My sister was with us, and she asked about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. She asked about it. She was inquisitive. She's kin to me. She's addictive. Anybody in our family that ever had a drink, anybody that ever had a drink became an alcoholic. You're either teetotalers or you're alcoholic. There were six of us at a meeting back home the other day. I, I guess it's still true and a whole lot more that need to be there. But my sister continued to ask me about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And my wife and I continued to tell her about the benefits and, and how wonderful it was. A little over three years ago, my sister called me one night. And she said, I've got the same problem that you've got. She didn't say, I want to get sober. She said, I want to be like you and Mary. My sister's coming up next week from Orlando, Florida, and celebrate her anniversary. She's a member of the Winter Park group of Alcoholics Anonymous. She's found Alcoholics Anonymous, and she's found a new way of life. So you see, 
Alcoholics Anonymous and the God that I understand and love today has took an absolute zero. And you people didn't knew that I was a zero. You took me and you walked along beside me all the way. And, and then God has took all of us. He's took all of us and blended us into a fellowship. Fellowship that's second to none in the world. So you see, I have an awful lot to be grateful for. I owe an awful lot to Alcoholics Anonymous and to people like you that have been inspirational to me through the years, that have given me the spark that I need when it's dark, to give me the energy the time when I get a little bit weak, to push me back down sometimes when I get up a little bit, to boost me up a little bit when I get down. So I have an awful lot to be grateful for. And God, as I understand him, has provided this for me and you, and I, I guess I'm like the little boy was. A little boy 12 years old that was real active, energetic, and loved to play more than anybody else. The little boy got sick, and his family carried him to specialist after specialist, and finally they found one that would treat him. That it's an infection of the spinal cord, and this young fellow's going to have to stay absolutely quiet and still for about six months. And when the little boy was told the alternatives, he said, I'll try it. So he put him in the bed, and he said, if I could just see outside. If I could just see outside, I believe I could make it. So they rigged him up a, a mirror over his bed that reflected to a mirror under the window so that he could look outside and he could see the top of the tree and the top of the skies. And he seemed to a feeling of calmness. Noticeable calmness was there. And people were amazed and they came to him and they said, how do you do this? He said, well, I've got an awful lot to be grateful for. He said, I could be dead. He said, but the doctors are giving me every opportunity in the world, and I've got so much to be thankful for, and they fixed it up so I can see outside. And he said, every night before I go to bed, I look at the stars, and there are a lot of them. And he said, the first star I see, I start counting my blessings. He said, I'm thankful for my mama and my daddy. I'm thankful for my doctors and my nurses and my friends. And he said, there's only one problem. He said, I always run out of stars before I run out of blessings. And that's the way I feel.